Hi everybody, in this video we're going to be talking about the differences between IBS and IBD. Now side note, I'm going to be talking pretty much exclusively about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but just so you know, there are other types of colitis and other types of IBD that I'm not going to be covering in this video. I'm just going to be talking about these two biggies. Let's get started. First, we need to talk about what part of the digestive tube is most affected in all three of these conditions, and then we can backpedal and talk about symptom presentation and how you as an individual will know if you most likely have IBS, IBD, and if IBD, which of the two types that we're talking about today. So first off, I've drawn a couple of pictures here, and we've got the colon coming and wrapping around like so, and then the small intestines are in the middle. And in this case, I've drawn the dark blue as the continuous type of inflammation that is typically seen with ulcerative colitis. It is, colitis indicates colon, so really the colon is the only part of the digestive system that's affected in UC, and it's going to be continuous, meaning there's going to be like a line of demarcation where you can see non-inflamed colon, inflamed colon. And from that point onward, it's usually pretty continuous all the way down to the rectum and possibly anus with the rectum being the most frequently affected. Then, if you look at the light blue patches with Crohn's disease, it's a different story. You get these patchy areas of inflammation and it can be all throughout the digestive tube, but it's usually going to be more isolated to this distal, terminal, or latter part of the small intestine called the ileum. But Crohn's can affect the colon the small intestine, and even other parts of the digestive tube. So Crohn's is a little bit different. With each of these, they if you read about differentiating IBD versus IBS, they will frequently say that these two are classified as diseases because we can see it on gross examination. If they do a colonoscopy or a CT or an MRI, you can visualize the structural changes and the tissue changes and we know that you have this disease. With IBS, this is typically called a diagnosis of exclusion, although that is starting to change slowly but surely. IBS is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning there's really no test that surefire way to tell you, yes, you have IBS. Instead, what you have to do is you have to rule out other conditions. You have to rule out IBD with a colonoscopy or you have to rule out structures with a CT, or you have to rule out celiac disease with an endoscopy. But there's no definitive test that will say, yes, you have IBS. And there is a caveat to that that I'll put in my notes below. It's called IBS smart. But now if we get to IBS, you'll notice I didn't actually draw any of the pink because that is still very much up for grabs. And the problem with IBS is that it's not all the same thing. People can have IBS because they have SIBO, you can have IBS because you're lactose intolerant and you don't realize it. You can have IBS because you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. You can have irritable bowel syndrome for a numerous, numerous different reasons. And I can't really show you on a picture like this what part of the digestive tract is most effective because for some people it's going to be small intestine and for some people it's going to be more colon. And some people also have GERD or also have overlapping issues where they have symptoms that present in their esophagus or stomach or elsewhere in their digestive system. Now that we've talked about what parts of the body are affected by each, let's talk about symptoms. So first and foremost, both of these, IBS and IBD, can cause malabsorption or maldigestion. They can cause bloating. You can have diarrhea or constipation, but there's going to be patterns associated with either one. IBS is truly a crapshoot, and I mean that with every pun intended. IBS you can have with diarrhea, or you can have with constipation. So there, or you can have a mixed presentation where you yo-yo back and forth between both. So IBS, we cannot necessarily diagnose via bowel movement changes because it can swing the pendulum in any given direction. With UC, almost always, and let's see, I'm gonna draw here. Almost always there will be diarrhea associated with UC, and I'll draw the list here. Oftentimes there is going to be blood in the stool if it is UC, and sometimes mucus. And that's because all of the damage is happening at the latter part of the colon, and it's right there, so the blood is pretty fresh, and you can see it clear as day in a stool sample in a UC patient. With, for example, Crohn's, 
Let's see, and I guess I'll draw Crohn's over here. Crohn's, you can have diarrhea or constipation. You can have blood and mucus in the stools, but it's less common. But one of the things that really goes hand in hand with Crohn's is malabsorption or maldigestion. So if you have a lot of nutrient deficiencies and you're wondering why, beyond just you know leaky gut or celiac, it might be that there's Crohn's disease and that, since it affects the small intestines, is more likely to cause malabsorption than the others. It's not a, a surefire thing, but it does happen quite a bit. And then with IBS, that is going to be characterized by typically a combination of abdominal pain, abdominal bloating or distension or feeling of fullness, and some bowel movement changes. Again, whether you swing the pendulum in the direction of diarrhea or constipation or a mixed presentation, any of those could fit under the umbrella of IBS. But one of the key differentiating things with IBS is that according to the Rome criteria, which is typically used to diagnose it officially, those, that discomfort or that abdominal pain usually is relieved by defecation or having a bowel movement. So if you have diarrhea or constipation or both, or fecal abnormalities of any kind, and bloating and pain, at least moderately frequently, and that bloating and pain is at least somewhat relieved by having a bowel movement, you're probably looking more at IBS, particularly if there's no blood or mucus in your stool, versus IBD, where typically there is going to be more of a predilection for diarrhea, although again, Crohn's, you can have constipation with that. Malabsorption can run the gamut, but really is going to be more in Crohn's. And then finally with UC, blood and mucus in the diarrhea is very common. Another key differentiating point between the two types of IBD is you can imagine kind of drawing a dotted line down the middle of your stomach. And more frequently, UC patients are going to feel their pain or feel the discomfort on the left side of their abdomen versus, and you can make sense of it anatomically, if that last part of the small intestine before it reaches the beginning of the colon, if that is what's affected mostly by Crohn's disease, then most of their pain and discomfort is going to be localized on the right. And again, with IBS, it's anybody's guess. You can have discomfort in the upper right, the lower right, the upper left, the lower left, smack in the middle, all over. It, there's no rhyme or reason to it. It just depends on what the causes of IBS are for you. Now, finally, let's talk about one more thing that you could use to differentiate between IBS and IBD, which is associated conditions and associated diseases. Very frequently with IBS, there will be other squirrely mystery conditions like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, things that are poorly understood by the medical community, and they will chalk it up to a syndrome and not a real disease, which is complete bullshit, but that's a topic for another day. Typically, this is going to be one of several syndromes that the person will present with versus IBD frequently goes hand in hand with other autoimmunity or other signs of inflammation, such as joint pain, fever, fatigue, or possibly inflammation of the eyes like uveitis, sometimes ankylosing spondylitis, which is an autoimmune condition of the spine. It really runs the gamut, but those inflammatory arthropathies, as they're called, like rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis and joint pain is, I think, one of the more common things that are associated with IBD. A lot of my IBD patients also come in telling me that they have a lot of joint pain. So that's one of the things that I focus a lot of my effort on. I haven't seen as many IBD patients with uveitis and eye inflammation, but I know it does happen, and I have seen that before. Whereas with IBS, that's not as common, particularly the eye inflammation is pretty uncommon with IBS if that is purely what it is. Now, it's also worth noting that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, is not uncommon in any of these conditions. So as you're picking apart your root causes and figuring out what dysfunctions your body has and looking for answers, one of the things that should be on your radar is SIBO. Certainly everybody on this channel probably knows this by this point because SIBO is my absolute pet that I talk about all the time. But with IBS, we're looking at, I mean, different studies say different things, but I've seen a range of like 20% upwards of close to 80% 
for the rate of SIBO. And that's going to depend on what methodology they used, what kind of breath test, or if they did a jejunal aspirate or a duodenal aspirate. But rates of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in IBS populations is staggeringly high. So if you have IBS or if you have these symptoms, definitely rule out SIBO as a cause of your IBS. Now, here's the catch-22, though, is that these two conditions also have at least a moderately high level of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, particularly, I'm going to circle this, Crohn's. Crohn's disease has quite a high rate of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which shouldn't be terribly surprising just knowing how SIBO works. SIBO is where some of the bacteria from your colon march their way into the latter part of your small intestine where they don't belong, frankly, and they cause symptoms for you. And if the inflammation is localized typically to that latter part of the small intestine or the ileum, it's not surprising that a lot of ulcer, or I'm sorry, a lot of Crohn's disease patients have SIBO. I'll link, there's a really great 2019 meta-analysis that talked about this in depth, and they listed out the studies that they included in the meta-analysis. Some of them ranged up to 45% of the Crohn's disease patients had SIBO, and some were as low as like the mid 20% range, like 25%. But either way, that is a lot higher than controls, and it's relevant to the, the Crohn's disease crowd. Whereas ulcerative colitis, it was a lower rate, but it's still higher than healthy normals. It, those ranged from, I think a lot of the studies that looked at ulcerative colitis looked more in like the 10 to 20% range for UC versus 20 to 45% in Crohn's. So if you have any of the three conditions or if you have any of these symptoms, getting evaluated for SIBO via a breath test or an aspirate and then treating that appropriately can become a really huge foundational part of your healing journey. So executive summary time, what is your takeaway? If you have right-sided abdominal pain primarily or discomfort and you have either diarrhea or constipation or if you struggled with malabsorption or have mucus in your stool but not necessarily blood, I would tend to think more of the Crohn's disease direction. If you have left-sided abdominal pain primarily and you have blood or mucus or a combination thereof in your stool and you have a tendency towards diarrhea, then I would much more think of ulcerative colitis. If you have widespread diffuse abdominal pain and bloating, or if it kind of ping pongs around, or if it's not you know, isolated to one particular area, if you have those diffuse symptoms and a lot of bloating, and have either constipation, diarrhea, or a mixture of both, and you have other conditions that are associated like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, then I would think more along the lines of IBS, particularly if those symptoms are at least partially alleviated by having a bowel movement. Now, luckily, the beauty of all of these is that either way, it comes down to modulating your gut microbiota, feeding the good and inhibiting the bad. And while the patterns of dysbiosis are different between the groups, there is a lot that can be done naturally for all three of these conditions. Whether you're talking about anti-inflammatories, probiotics, prebiotics, nutritional support, there's a myriad of support for these conditions, no matter which one you think you have. I wish you the best of luck in your healing journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. Oh, and last thing, please subscribe to my channel. If you do, I will continue to do this super awkward dance at the end of every video. It really actually supports the channel a lot and gives me out, gives me the ability to make more of these videos and be a goofball on YouTube. So if you would click subscribe, click the little bell and follow me on Instagram or Facebook, I would be just so appreciative. Have a great day.